Hey everybody, how you doing today? My name is Jeff Freeman and welcome to the Curse of Oak Island and Beyond live stream. And right over here is my co-host, Jack Campbell. Jack, how you doing today? Fine, good afternoon, Jeff. At, uh, and today, folks, I have our very, very special guest coming on today. We have Holly Remke, Remkes, I'm sorry, Remkes, and Warren Gettler. Sorry about that. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Hey, everybody. So um, let's start off with Holly. Uh, you know, Holly, you know, you, um, we, we all watched the Beyond Oak Island uh, TV show, many of us have anyway, and it was fascinating. And, you know, so we saw on there, we got a little brief idea of who you are and uh, some of the things that you are involved in. Um, I'd like to try to get a little background if we could, because I know that's really cool and very important to me. And I know a lot of our viewers feel the same way. Um, you're, a, you're an author of children's books. Um, and I think you uh, are also considered what a, the desert detective. Is that, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a term term we came up with for the moment. <laughs> but, so tell us yeah. a little bit about your children's book. So uh, is this something that you wrote a long time ago, or is this more recent? Or? Yeah, I wrote the Gunny Sack Man years and years ago, and my my um, older kids were younger, and I've got. Um, my daughter Ruth and Karen are two of the characters in this book. Wow. Helps you get helps mothers uh, or parents get their kids motivated to clean up their rooms. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> those well, kids are a lot older now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we all could have used that back then. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for so much for coming on the show today. We really appreciate it. And I know we're going to be digging into this as we go along, but let's jump over to Warren. Warren Gettler. Uh, Warren, you are a veteran journalist, author, researcher. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started with all this. Well, thanks, Jeff. It's great being here with you and Jack and Holly. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I have a background in journalism. I was with the Wall Street Journal and the Herald Tribune, Bloomberg, and Discovery. And wow. uh, I went off from there to become an entrepreneur. Um, and I write books still and enjoy going out and looking for treasure and writing about the Knights of the Golden Circle. Um, I have, you know, I have two books, Rebel Gold, uh, as you probably know, this one is. And yes, I have that right here. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, we both, we're, we're both, we're both. We all have it, yeah. And, and that was written with Bob Brewer, who's a great guy. I'll be talking about him. And uh, I also wrote recently a, a novel called Panic, and it's about kids uh, journeying through the journey of, of anxiety, which is a huge issue now with COVID. And... Uh, we're doing a kind of music and book tour called the Age of Anxiety Campus Tour this year, so I'm pretty excited about that. It's a, it's a, it's a ebook with music embedded in it. It's called Panic. Wow, that's really neat. And uh, so, yeah, we'll have to uh, talk about that as we get ready to close. We'll bring that up, and maybe we can give people a link to that. That's really interesting. So, welcome to you both, and thank you so much for coming on today. And as I was saying. Um, you know, we, we all love the, uh, the Beyond Oak Island, the, uh, the, the TV show itself, and now they're working on season two. Um, and we know that many times, and, and my, my members uh, and the viewers are used to hearing me say this, but, you know, so oftentimes when they have their um, researchers and, uh, and folks like yourselves on one of these shows, you're filmed for hours and hours and hours but then we get to see a very small portion of that, maybe five or 10 minutes of your actual uh, information and research that you want to put out. We don't, we only get a piece of it. What I like to do, do with this show, show here is to give you an opportunity to really kind of get more into it and really explain things to us a little bit better because with just that, that, you know, 20,000 foot level view, we don't get enough. At least I don't. And I certainly want to get more as we go along here. So, um, uh, you know, with that show uh, we watched, um, it started off, of course, with Maddie and uh, talking with uh, Marty and Rick Lagina uh, a little bit about, um, you know, the treasure and things of that nature, which we're all we all love the treasure side of it. Right. Um, but now they jumped into an area. They were talking about the KGC. Now, the KGC, the Knights of the Golden Circle, um, I was really I had very little education on that. And I'm hoping that today that you can help us to understand that a little bit better. Maybe we can start there. Warren, if you'd like, um, what's the KGC all about and what, where did that come from? Yeah, so the Knights of the Golden Circle was a subversive organization, the underground of the Confederacy, um, that was very powerful before the Civil War, during and after. And they had a goal of creating an empire that would be 
expansive beyond the 13 Confederate states down to Central America, Mexico, part of South America, up to Cuba, a circle, if you will. Wow. And that would be basically a slave-based economy, slavery-based economy. Um, that would be operating. That would be maybe the separation goal. If they stayed in the union, they wanted to have more votes on Capitol Hill in Congress to outweigh the union states by making that expansionary move. Um, what they became was the most powerful sub underground, maybe most powerful organization in U.S. history because they were not only fomenting civil war and, and causing problems in the North, not just the South, uh, not just supporting the South in the South, but they were also undermining the Union's efforts in the North through their branch in the North called the Copperheads. Oh, okay. I did hear that reference once. Yeah. And, okay. and there were as many, if not more, of them up North as there was down South, weren't there? So... It's a fair point. They were being organized in Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, et cetera. And Lincoln and the generals were quite concerned about their force. This is as the war was coming to a head. Um, and their, the, the background of this book is how they came to be and what did they do during the Civil War and then after, because they went underground when Gettysburg was lost. Mm, right. And, started burying gold and arms for a second civil war. But what needs to be said, a couple important things is they were Confederate and Masonic, this group. In the end, the Masonic hand was more, was more long lasting. So these treasures that we'll be talking about today are potentially still guarded by some force. Their mission has changed. It's no longer to see a second civil war get off the ground obviously that probably faded after the first world when the first world war came they kind of gave up that goal mm -hmm. so what what this book is all about and how i got in touch with holly is this amazing network of underground treasure which is demarcated by symbols the carvings and the rocks on tree faces some some maps exist um and it was a system that was organized by their uh, commander and intellectual chief, which was Albert Pike, uh, who was yeah. Albert Pike. He was a top ranking Mason at the time of the Scottish Rite. Um, it had a field commander in Jesse James, for sure. We see his carvings everywhere, his signature. It had a political assassin by the name of John Wilkes Booth involved. Yeah. And it had many, many, many leaders <laughs> that you've all heard about, probably including General McClellan of the North, and Stanton of the wow. North, the Secretary of War. So the, the Knights of the Golden Circle was a political group and a military group, and it had some quasi thematic, not religious, but some sort of social theme behind it. Um, it is linked to the Knights Templar and their traditions and the wow. Rosicrucians mm -hmm. and their system of burial, of secret Masonic burial of treasure and things of value is definitely linked to Oak Island. Wow. See, and that's what we're, we'll get into that more as we go along here. I know. Um, and Holly for, you know, Warren mentioned the symbolism, um, the symbols that they created and these symbols would be, and I guess uh, if I, if I understand this correctly, that may, basically the symbols are there to navigate uh, other insiders as to where they've hidden these types of things. Um, now that's where you come into play. And first of all, before we get into that, tell us a little bit, how did you and Warren meet? How did this come about? Yeah. I reached out to Warren because I read his book. Um, originally I started um, exploring the desert looking for, uh, actually when I started looking for treasure, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the desert as a, as a kid and growing up, but, um, I don't know if you've heard of Forrest Fenn and the treasure that he hid. It was um, a more recent one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he hid a treasure and my sister and I were kind of excited about going to look for it. And we thought, hey, we should go find it. And anyway, the clues he left, uh, we thought it might be over in Yellowstone. And we thought, well, maybe we'll look online or find some books about something that's closer to us. And so we did some research and found some, some uh, local treasure stories. And then we... Um, bought every book that there was after we started <laughs> noticing what was in our area. We yeah. were astounded at what we found, um, the different markers and things. And we're like, this is really weird. That's just like this, the thing in the treasure book. And then we um, started noticing some of the petroglyphs 
didn't look, I don't know, they didn't look like Native American petroglyphs. And anyway, I think it was my sister bought Warren's book, Shadow of the Sentinel, and I ended up um, buying a copy. And anyway, I, I wanted to reach out to Bob Brewer and got Warren instead. <laughs> it was kind of cool. <laughs> but he has been amazing. He knows his stuff. He is, he is excellent. And it was just neat to see and, and reading his book. I hadn't read about most of that. I'd never heard of the Knights of the Golden Circle until yeah, Warren's either, book. Yeah. And I'm like, how could this even be? I mean, how is this what I'm seeing. And anyway, I, I corresponded with him over the last several years. And yeah, it's, it's just been a really neat journey. I say, and he's, he's amazing. I say, he knows so much. And I've just been, I say, it's just been a, a really cool thing. But um, I was reading one book, it said that there's um, a lot of people have a cache in their, vis probably within an hour of their home. And you look at the amount of um, banks, in your community and you think of um, banking from clear back um, it's been going on for a long time but i do think that utah has um, something extra and very large and i think that um, a lot of it does have to do with mining and a lot of the stuff the markers are um, marking some of the very rich sources of mineral and some of the very ancient things that were were here before but yeah. KGC were following this stuff. It's Warren, been neat. Warren, how did you meet Bob? Is it well, I'm going to pick up, I'll get to that in a sec, Jack. I want to pick up on Holly said. <laughs> so Utah is, is wide open. It's a great place to bury hundreds of millions of dollars of gold and silver and arms and be able to watch it from a distance. And that was also a key link in the Western Railroad that was going to California with <laughs> Wow. And it was also a key link in a rail that went up to Montana where gold and uh, copper were coming down, other, other minerals that were being mined by Jesse James, uh, a Senator William A. Clark uh, lookalike, if not the same person. That's a fascinating story. Wow. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, that's okay. All right. okay. So um, let's just to go to Jack's question. How did I meet Bob? Oh, God. I'll try and keep that very simple. All right. Um, met some folks on a train in, in coming back from New York based on my fossil hobby, paleontology. And they were at the same thing. And they said, we're going out uh, to meet a friend, Alan Witten, who is a geophysicist, underground expert, right? So I, I was at Discovery and I lectured at Alan's class at the University of Oklahoma. When I was lecturing, when I got done with my lecture, to the geophysics for jocks class. It was kind of funny. Um, the two women got up and started talking to the class and they showed a video and it was a video of Jesse James gold coins being taken by a couple of guys off a of property. It was very cool. They, they pulled up the jar. They, the, the underground pistol burial was pointing to the jar. It's great. I go, Whoa, what was that? And I asked them, you know, I'm a journalist. So I went up to the girls right away, the ladies, uh, the Gillespie sisters, they're in the book. And, and I immediately said, how'd you get this tape? Who gave it to you? And they said, oh, this guy, Bob Brewer, you got to meet him. I said, yes, I want to meet yeah. him. <laughs> and the story that had been told to the sisters by Bob, the reason they have the videotape is Bob sent the videotape to them saying, I apologize. I was on your property. I found these gold coins with a partner. The partners did not tell me we were trespassing. And I feel bad about that. And I can come back and help you find the rest of the gold coins there. Okay. That's what the girls told me. So I met Bob Brewer in a small motel in maybe Atoka, Oklahoma in, get this, 1998. I think wow. I'm going to this thing. And he looked at me. Okay, young man. He's about 12 years old. He goes, okay, young man. Remember this. You came to me. I didn't come to you. This story goes way back. It involves my family. And then he looked at me in the eyes and he says, and it's dangerous. And I said, I'm on, let's go. <laughs> just, been a, just been a tornado ripped past, you know, my first major tornado going by. I said, oh, this is going to be a journey. And uh, I swear, Jack and Jeff, within a week or maybe a month, let's say a month, I was back in Arkansas with him. And um, I met 
his family, his great wife, uh, his kids. And we started a journey that was absolutely fascinating. It's probably going to be my legacy as a journalist and author, this story. And uh, we went to a dozen or half dozen treasure sites. I've been to probably 15 since then, KGC sites. Wow. We looked at these maps. He showed me video of things that he found, treasure. And we went hunting for this stuff, like I mentioned before. We, we went hunting for it with an armed guard. We tracked down KGC pointers that created lines that cross. And where they cross, he'd look at me and say, we got to dig here. And we dig and we'd find stuff. We found a big metal heart that was a big symbol. And we went into a vault. We dug out a vault in Arizona. This is all a private property. And it had already been gotten into. And the empty strong box was there. Oh, it wow. Got into already. Um, I'll tell you that it was a little heartbreaking not to pull up a big treasure with Bob when I was with him. <laughs> but I, I saw videotapes of him pulling up some sizable ones. And I knew it was a fact. I had to be sure of it, right? Because this is a oh, big, absolutely, yeah. This is this is a Simon and Schuster book, you know, and uh, I'm a I'm a journalist, and that has to be accurate. And and then we started, um, obviously, going having the time of our lives, it, going into the archives, the National Archives, like the movie National Treasure. That was us. We pulled up all these documents that had never been seen before. And I was fortunate because in 1998, the internet was starting to get going, mm -hmm. and I could go to Google and research Knights in the Golden Circle that nobody had ever searched for before. Mm -hmm. And I could find references and books going back to 1860, 1855, and, and then references to how powerful they were in the, in the writings back then, the Atlantic Magazine or others. They were, they were pointing with anonymous sources to the power of the Knights of the Golden Circle. It was really great. That's fascinating. And, and talking about, and, and actually in the reading of this book, you know, the whole, the whole first um, section of it is about Bob, Bob Brewer. And it's really fascinating that, you know, that's something that I kind of preluded to. Oh, by the way, I wanted to mention too, in my promo, I had said you had two books, uh, shadows of the Sentinel, I guess what, what's the title of the first one. Um, but I, they're actually the same book. Is that correct? They are the same. They are the same. And, okay. and you're right. The, the first part is about Bob. I mean, he has a fascinating history just for your listeners here, uh, your fans. So Bob, the first one was called Shadow of the Sentinel for a very specific reason. Bob lived in the shadow of his great uncle nearby who was a KGC Sentinel. Wow. That's, that's the beauty of the story because in the early 19... Well, not early. Yeah, early 1900s to mid 1900s, and then beyond. Um, his great uncle, Uncle Ode, was a uh, a sentinel protecting the treasure that was put there in the mountains of Arkansas by the KGC. And yeah, there's a picture. I think there's a, you have a picture in your book of that, if I remember correctly. And that that sentinel used to that man used to meet with uh, with some very prominent names, which I won't mention here, uh, that everybody would recognize if I said it. Uh, in Arkansas, and um, he even went out when his sixth kid was being born. His wife screamed at, at him, you know, there you go again. You're going out patrolling when your, your baby's being born. So his higher calling was to protect this money, and there's a, a diary that was found where he said he, sh he shot a cow, which, and a cow is kind of like an intruder in Masonic terms. Shot a cow. He didn't say cow, and shot a yes. cow in a cave. And... Um, now, I met their descendants with Bob. It was the most incredible interview I ever had uh, because he listened to my questions. And I've interviewed presidents and generals, and this guy was super sharp. He knew where I was going. I was bouncing around all different topics, you know, World War II and all this. And then I'd come back, and I said, Bob, here. And Bob never said a word during the interview. Bob tells me you went, you know, you'd go, you and your great uncle would go around protecting these sites or, no, I never said that, uh, checking on carvings and rock carvings and tree carvings. And what was all of that about? And then he would look at me and he'd glare at Bob. And in the end, <laughs> in the end, he told me, he warned me not to go too far down that road. He wow. did. I said, Bob, we got to go. So Bob Brewer is a fascinating guy, super smart. He's very intuitive. Um, he picked up his... To, to, for your audience's benefit, he didn't know what he was being groomed for. He was being trained, but he didn't know quite why. He went off to Vietnam, 
and his great uncle died before that knowledge was passed on to him for right. a specific purpose. Right. Yeah. And that's what we get. And I, like I said, in your book, you talk about that quite a bit. And uh, so we got a whole nother look at not only uh, the, the protectors, I guess the Sentinel, um, the protectors of this, we got a, 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 our first delve into that and then got the feeling of just like you'd said that Bob was being groomed for this. Um, and then off he went later in his life. He didn't actually be, wasn't able to come back to it until later in life and then really got into it deep. And that's how you got involved. So that's, we'll get into that some more as we go along here, but that's really fascinating. Now, going back over to you, Holly, that's something that, you know, talking about that symbolism and in, in, you know, the also being protectors, people protecting these things, um, you mentioned to me, you and I talked on the phone, you had mentioned to me about how you go off on these hikes and you go out. Now, you go out by yourself, right? I mean, you're looking for these symbols, but you're most of the time, are you out there by yourself? Sometimes. My brother, <laughs> Nathan, goes with me quite a bit and I have okay. kids and my husband come, goes with me sometimes. He bought me a gun too. So anyway. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's gotta be yeah, scary I've got siblings. So I've about yeah. wore everybody out, but if I can get somebody to go with me, I'll usually take somebody uh, but it's it's been really neat so that's what you're but, doing out there is you're looking for some of these same symbols on rocks and and you put up some fantastic pictures on your website and you've shared many of those with us on our group too and we appreciate that very much right. um, but you these faces and whatnot that you've come across are you know for tell, tell us a little bit about the symbolism that you've discovered and how that all works if you don't mind let me show you the this symbol right up I'm not that upside down. Anyway, this is a book I just put together not too long ago, but um, this is a circumpunct. And this symbol right here mm -hmm. is probably where they came up with the name for the Knights of the Golden Circle. This symbol is the symbol for God, gold, and the sun. And you'll see it um, in a lot of the, the different um, places that, are, that have gold and other things. But um, the symbols usually have more than one one meaning i say a lot of times they're kind of layered and mm -hmm. the first thing a lot of times you see um if you don't understand the whole message that's written you won't understand what they're talking about at first glance like I say anyway it's just really really interesting how they do that um there was one of the locations i went um and they had a big rock horse i mean most people can't see these things but it had the word a-c-u-l-t written on it and i thought that's really weird and I, I started seeing the the letters AC at a lot of the sites. I think we showed that on um, mm -hmm. one of the on the episode. And anyway, a cult means something is hidden. And I thought it was interesting that they rode on a horse too. I mean, the, and there was a, a cult, a, a baby horse head there as well, which I thought was kind of interesting. But they um, the AC is tied to to gold, I uh, say so a lot of times, and it's also the number thirteen, which is tied to treasure rooms often. Um, but there's meaning within the meaning within the meaning. And these guys, is, it's just super fascinating when you study um, a symbol because a lot of times at first glance, you're not going to get the full depth of the meaning. And I they'll, mm -hmm. they cloak things. I say that's kind of their way of doing things. They cloak it and um, veil it. it. It's kind of veiled in plain sight, usually. They take you in one direction. They really mean the other direction, in other words. <laughs> Often, yeah. They say dig here and <laughs> don't dig there. <laughs> right. Quite there, are, often. there are some definitive KGC symbols for gold. The best one is a turtle laying eggs, and you, you follow the direction of the tail. But the problem is, unless you're Bob Brewer or a few other folks who really know this stuff, um, it's very hard to get to that last 20 yards, 10 yards, one yard and find something because um, the system is not random. It's worked out in a very programmatic way and they have, um, if you know where the center point of your location is, you can put it there and use a template, which is a pretty ornate diagram of a circle and a square and angles coming through it. And then you have little dots along the uh, concentric circles. If you know the scale of your area and you have some old maps and you know the center point, you can lay it down and go to some spots and get oriented. Once you're oriented by that geometry and that secret map system and maybe by some coded articles that were written a long time ago, then you can start working the carvings 
to get you to very specific spots. Now, the reason that it has to kind of work independently well or together uh, is that carvings get eroded, trees fall down, these yep. KTP carvings. So um, there are thousands of these sites and there are thousands of people now looking for them. Um, they've all seen pieces of the puzzle, but it's very hard to get the full picture. Sacred what? geometry. Oops, sorry. No, go ahead, please. I say he's he's talking about sacred geometry. I think that's tied to a lot of the way that these things are set up. And sorry, sorry. I, I, my dogs. Oh, I thought that was my mic, <laughs> like in <laughs> growling sounds. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, the the sacred geometry, the the Masonic, um, the compass and square, the the meanings that they have. Um, that they teach a lot of times those are the way that these sites, sites are set up i shouldn't say a lot of times that is how they're set up right yeah, yeah the, go ahead yeah i was going to pick up on that what holly was saying so remember what we said at the outset the knights of the golden circle were a confederate and scottish right masonic organization mm -hmm. the scottish right masonic organization gave that the organization shape and form meaning how to induct people how to identify each other through sacred grips, secret grips, secret coded words, secret meeting places, how to rise through the ranks. But most importantly, the geometry, which is so central to masonry, the G and the compass and square, I believe, and is representative of geometry. This geometry, if you can understand some of the symbolism and those really occult-like uh, carvings that Holly sees all the time in Utah. It allows you to figure out how to get back as an insider, as you said, Jeff, to the buried treasure because they don't want everybody to know and they don't want people like me and Holly to necessarily reveal too much. I think they're, they've been willing for us to show how this network came to be and how powerful it was and how big it is in terms of what's in the ground. But that's about it. Wow. And and so, you know, going back to the KGC now, after the, the war, there was, I guess there was a lot uh, of what I had heard. And this is in the beginning of the the episode and Beyond Oak Island. Um, in the beginning, they're talking a little bit about how they had stashed um, some of this treasure or gold and silver coins in, in jars, I guess, or whatever, in whatever they had. They stashed it around in some of the states, Arkansas and, and Tennessee and things of that nature. And, and then on, this, on the show, they alluded to the fact that they gathered up this stuff and then they headed out west. Is that, is that what basically what your research has discovered as well? Or mm, I, I don't really agree with the idea that they gathered it all up. There's plenty of really big sites in Tennessee, uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Georgia, um, Virginia, I would think, even, I'm going to add, in the north, and I'm working on that with the Copperheads. Um, that could be a big, big reveal soon. Um, but the biggest ones were out west because it was so wide open. Yep. yep. New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, um, New Mexico, where I'm also involved in something very exciting. And, and, you know, if Holly were bringing to bear scientific equipment beyond just some metal detecting, and she's not really done a lot of that, she's been mapping these sites. Right. If, if she were to launch a project with the right permitting that was doable, legal, et cetera, as she would do, then she would be, you know, making some interesting discoveries. Right now, she's made discoveries on the surface, but not underground. So what I, the point is, there are very big treasures where she is. I can tell by what's out there. Very big. And it fits with More the than, map. yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, that Sorry, was, I always talk over you. That was Confederate territory. They were welcome there, too, weren't they? When, even after the war for a while. So the Confederates were, the KGC in particular, were very active in the West. They almost brought California into the union before you know everything happened they had a huge units in in california and oregon and they were very active in the mining area and they threatened the gold coming into the union that lincoln was re relying on they would raid 
stagecoaches with gold right there in California. Um, but they were also active, as you know, Glorieta Pass in New Mexico was the westernmost battle of the Confederacy. So the Confederates tried to take over New Mexico territory. Um, they were in Utah territory, no battle was fought. Um, they were very active in the mining operations of Denver, which was gold dust as opposed to, you know, the nuggets. And um, what state am I forgetting? Oh, in Arizona, you know, part of my book, it deals a lot with Superstition Mountain, and that was a cover story, we believe, Bob and I, for KGC operations there, where they were mining, they were putting gold in, into mine shafts and protecting it. And that's something that you had mentioned in the um, in the pre-show we talked a little bit about, is that you know everybody thinks, well, okay, a lot of this gold that they found and they had out west was from Jesse James, you know, robbing this train and that bank or whatever he was doing, but they were into mining as well. Right. And getting coming up with their own. Yeah. So, uh, Jeff and Jack, right now I'm excited because for the first time, history is looking at the KGC for something much bigger than it was ever described before. To the point Jeff just made, um, they absolutely were business operators. They ran mining operations, Jesse James at the helm in Montana, in Colorado, in California, 100%. And we'll get to Jesse James not having been killed, as everybody thinks, in 1882. He faked his Okay. So they were, they were massively into industry. It was not just because, you know, for a while he was robbing stagecoaches. Right. Yeah, so far beyond that, he was a, a magnet, if you will. But where did this money go? It went into their operations. Rail and mining were the two big ones. Cattle. Oil, I would say oil as well. There's no question they were in oil. Wow. So, so, so in my lifetime, I hope it comes out just how amazing a character Jesse James was. There, I can't think of a more colorful character. And we'll talk about the Black Book, which is written by an alleged descendant of his. And let me tell the let me tell the audience here about uh, Orvis Lee Hawk, Jesse James the Third. No matter what people say about him or J. Frank Dalton, I know for a fact, it's true, for a fact, because the stories he, I have his letters. I, I read the letters as a journalist. I went out and I tracked down the symbols and the way the things work as he's describing, as he drew, based on what his great grandfather was saying to him before he died. Mm -hmm. Jesse James, that is. This is his descendant. It's true because it all works. It, it's, it's empirical. You can dig it up exactly like they did find treasure that way. I'm going to give you something spooky. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Okay. The man I'm talking about who wrote the black book with a journalist back in the seventies. So um, this book you're talking about? Yeah, the black book. Jesse James is one of his names. That book is real. There's just a lot of colorful stuff in there to kind of throw you off, but there's so <laughs> much of it is true. It costs $500 a copy to get this book, but you can, you can read it now in digital form. Somebody was, went out and digitized it and made some money off of it. But here's a fact. The guy who wrote that book with the deceased journalist um, said on tape, which I've listened to, that they, that they actually uh, eliminated somebody because he was getting too close. And the uncle of the, per the, the nephew of the person who was eliminated said, my, my uncle didn't die. I didn't, I didn't commit suicide. He was killed. So I have a descendant of the KGC saying that his uncle, who was a great treasure hunter, did not commit suicide, but was killed by, 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 by some organization. Then I have this descendant of the KGC saying they knocked him off on tape. Hmm. There's a lot of, there's a lot. What I'm trying to say is there's evidence, there's documentary evidence that the Knights of the Golden Circle were very, very powerful into the 20th century and may still exist. In fact, do still exist in some form. I've noticed a lot of the sites look like they had a lot of activity in the 1930s. And yeah. so that's what I'm seeing uh, evidence of. And a well, lot of the- I'm gonna jump in on that, Holly, to that mm -hmm. point, sorry. Um, she said something very critical there. They moved, to Jeff's point earlier, they moved stuff in the 30s. That's when they moved it during FDR's time. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to point that out. Nope. That's great. I say, cause I think it had to do with the, 
gold becoming illegal as well yeah, in the U.S. Is, and it looked like they were redepositing some of the gold back into these depositories is what I think. Um, you, it's, it's amazing she should say that because those words came out of Bob Brewer's mouth. How about that? Here's uh, yeah, the that's what I'm seeing at the sites. I mean, they had activity. I mean, and during the different war periods, not just the Civil War, they were um, these depositories were were used to fund other wars. Is what I'm seeing. At least that's what I think I'm seeing. Oh wow! But there's some kind of activity that's been consistent, and um, it's really interesting. <laughs> well, talk about that a little bit. I mean, when you when you mentioned that you've seen some of this, and and is this just in the Utah? I mean, you're going around in other places besides. No, it's the Utah, it's. Right? I, I went down to um, Arizona and I saw some things there that I'm like, hey, there's a cache site. We drove drove over. I saw a cave that had been closed off. I saw the site, the symbols and things, and there was a Masonic. Um, it looked really new, um, probably not older than. No, it didn't look older than 100 years old anyway, but it was a Masonic guy doing the as above, so below symbol um, anyway. And it was etched in there on that cave, but it looked like it was um, something the Spanish had done originally. And it looked like they were um, keeping track of that is what it looked like. Wow. Yeah, the KGC definitely um, expropriated uh, Spanish treasure from the past and accumulated it. Um, they definitely, their descendants moved treasure under the FDR regime when gold, owning gold was not allowed. Um, they moved it, the, the CCC Conservation Corps, some of those folks were involved. And, the, and I should mention the Knights of the Golden Circle were embedded as moles in U.S. agencies like the U.S. Geological Survey in making mm -hmm. early maps. Oh, I very mean, much so. Uh, so much of this treasure is based <laughs> on their official maps and topography maps it's it's amazing how have, how you, they are. have you ever looked at the um the shape of montana let's see he looks anyway montana i think was done deliberately to look like abraham lincoln let's see oh, really? you'll have to look at that but yeah oh, wow. it's really interesting but that's where <laughs> anyway um Jesse James under his alias had spent a lot of time too but there you study the way that they mapped that and Anyway, it's really interesting. I think it had to do with gold, um, just the the shape. But they use faces quite often. The map that I, I think it ended up on that uh, episode that we showed just very briefly of Utah, it had some of that done in it, and you could kind of see where some of the depositories um, would be and or suspect would be. Right. Well, you had mentioned too that, or Warren had mentioned that they had infiltrated themselves into some government agencies and thereby being able to. You know, because I think that was that question was brought up on the on Beyond Oak Island on the show. You know, how would they get in there and change the name, the spelling, or like mm -hmm. you had mentioned, yeah, or, or put little symbols or whatever? How would that how would that get done? And I guess it's by infiltrating these government agencies. And what yeah. I'm seeing too at these sites, it's really interesting. Um, I was studying one, and I knew that there should be some more some of probably the 1930 guys writings or the 1800s i mean I, I knew from looking at the the rock markers that they'd done something there and my brother and i scoured the area back and forth and anyway the sun came out and it hit the the edge of the ledge there and there was writing there and it said to look and it had a name written, written <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> written on the rock and anyway it was um a guy from Kanab. Utah, which is where supposedly Montezuma's treasure is or whatever. But um, anyway, he owned the Great Lakes area over there. And um, it looked like he was tied to um, doing surveying. But I keep seeing these names of these surveyors. Um, and I could tell kind of what they were surveying, it looks like, not just um, just regular mapping. They were, right. I mean, they were doing a little bit more than what meets the eye. But it was really interesting to see this over and over again. Mm -hmm. And anyway, but yeah, and I don't think that they were all Confederate either. I think that they're definitely there, but there's, I don't know, let's say some of the people I'm studying, I think they're on the other side, but the Jesse James book mentioned that he played Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He did both sides of a lot of things. So wow. it's, I don't know, it's kind of confusing. And here area of Utah has a lot of Jesse James yeah. Symbols there in that area right there, if I'm correct. Yep. Yes. The JJ, the backward J's, the anchor. Mm -hmm. We saw them when we were out with Maddie. We had a great time looking for those. And 
you see them in New Mexico, Utah, Arizona. There you go. Yeah, oh, I've got a picture of that, pointing it out. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, look, you know, they were proud of the work they did. Why not take credit for it, right? With a little signature, JJ. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Uh, you know, and, and, and again, that symbolism, uh, you know, you were when you were out there with Maddie, uh, there were times where you had mentioned, you know, seeing like the and, and I guess we go ahead and allude in or, you know, segue into this a little bit, too. You know, when we were talking about the Freemasons or the Templar, um, they may not have been, you know, descendants of those, but they borrowed from those traditions. Is that is that kind of the way you were looking at that? Well, yeah, uh, that's how I put it, borrowed from those traditions, upholding certain Templar and Rosicrucian traditions. Um, you know, there's a term, Priory of Zion, that comes up, um, and that goes back to Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code mm -hmm. and a book that's kind of similar to what we did but sold a lot more called Holy Blood, Holy Grail in Europe. Um, so... So the, uh, the Templar tradition is definitely there in terms of the geometry and the layouts um, and the notion of being rebellious against the established authority, right? You know, so that would go with the Confederate thing against the Union or, or the tyrant that they claimed Abraham Lincoln to be. Mm, right. So... Um, and, you know, if you talk to high-ranking Masons, they will pretty much acknowledge a link to Templar tradition and Rosicrucians, etc. How you found a lot of the rectangles, didn't you, there, when you were in the area you were there, as were Templar-oriented, if I am correct? Oh, yes. I say quite a bit. I say quite a bit. Yeah, one of the one of the symbols that was brought up on the show also, uh, and this was that face that you were talking about. Um, basically, mm -hmm. you can see the eye of the face right here, and uh, and then of course the ear. Um, and you said, you know, okay, and, and, and you know, and again, this is captured right from the uh, the episode uh, Beyond Oak Island. Um, this symbol means that that means there's gold nearby. Yes, and I found where the origin of that came from, I think. Oh, really? Because, anyway, I was looking in a old Spanish code book, and that's um, the code for, I, anyway, they used it for the, for, or, for the O for Oro, and I think it was the 18th century um, usage of it. And I've seen it used quite a bit here in Utah. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. It is Oro. Uh, at our sites in Oklahoma of KGC, the word Oro is spelled out, and you see infinity signs, too, for Oro. Yeah, it had that exact one in this book. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, uh, but it looked like that's a, what they used here quite a bit. But I was stumped going, why that symbol for gold nearby? I couldn't make sense out of it. And then I, yeah, it was uh, in the Spanish uh, treasure hunting book, a very old one. Well, but, now you would think that you know, with all these symbols like that, you would think that you know there had to be some sort of a, a book of the symbols to explain to you what they all meant. But I, I would think that's being secretive. They wouldn't want to write those down. Yeah. How in the world would they be able to to remember all these different things? They were very, very smart, I think, <laughs> especially with the layers of meanings that they used. I am mm -hmm. just astounded with some of the the way that these guys' minds worked. Um, originally, when I first started studying these sites, I knew that I needed to learn to think like the creators of these um, these sites. And I'm like, how in the world? But once you start learning a little bit, you kind of understand their thought process. And it's, mm -hmm. um, anyway, they're, anyway pretty cool <laughs> like, well, I, and it'd be able to probably pass it down through generations the same way also. right i right. think so because mm -hmm. they had those sayings like he'll conceal and ne'er reveal and don't write it in any way on but yet um they taught each other or at least they're the people in their groups the symbols and the things that they needed to know that mm -hmm. could be understood thousands of years later a lot of it goes back to well i'm seeing tubal cain but um king solomon it seems like he's um one of the key uh, ties to most of these sites that I'm seeing. Yeah, that's uh, Masonic. That's Masonic tradition. Yeah, right. Holly's Holly's a uh, very dogged and intuitive, and she's covered tons of terrain gravely <laughs> to her credit. I've always warned her to be careful. I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, so. Uh, 
but you have to use intuition and research to pull all this together and some and some courage and bravery if you want to go out. You know, it's not just the snakes that she uh, <laughs> that about stopped me. She put me to shame on the <laughs> show. She said a couple of words. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait for me. Climbing, climbing. But uh, no, Holly special. <laughs> uh, she's she's put together an amazing archive of KGC carvings and markers, marker stones in Utah. It's it's a, a walking museum. I hope the world gets to appreciate how extensive it is and get, goes beyond a certain level. Um, but it is dangerous. At one point, we were talking six years ago, you know, via the internet, and she said, Warren, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what? And she said, well, when I, at one of my cash sites, meaning she figures there, there's gold there, uh, she said, somebody came back and put a penny there. That sounded you know, so dumb to anybody else probably, but. Out, out in the boonies in the canyon lands, nobody would be there. And I said, a penny, okay, Lincoln penny, right? And I said, so so what's the deal? And then she showed me a picture and the picture of the penny had, a, I'll turn it, it had, it had a, a thing. Eye. <laughs> it, had a, it had a elongated oval, like, like we're watching you symbol coming out of the eye etched in it. Well, what caught my attention was I'd gone down that path. I mean, it was in the middle of really nowhere. And um, the disturbing thing is, is, how did they know I was there? But they left the penny, but they spray painted a little spot of spray paint. And I'm like, that's weird. I wonder what that little dot of spray paint is. And they'd left the penny there. That year's penny. Um, anyway, kind of interesting. A little <laughs> disturbing. <laughs> Bothered me. <laughs> Put two and two together. They, you know, she she was being watched from far away. Um, they knew it. They knew where she was, probably by some sort of electronic detection device. Yep. They knew she would return, so so that she wouldn't miss the penny. They put a big green spray paint there and draw draw drew her attention to that. And then she looked at it and she sent the picture to me. And I said, "Okay, Holly, you should stop this." I'm stubborn. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> It scared me for a little bit. You had footprints, didn't you? I had a couple I've, of nights after you multiple times. And came back and there were other footprints there? Multiple times in some areas that there's no reason unless somebody, I mean, it could be a local guy going, what is this weird lady doing? I mean, I've had some of those situations that were pretty embarrassing, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the beginning of my book deliberately is a scene where yeah. Bob Brewer as a young man is tracking some things down early in his adventure. Uh, his true life adventure, and there's a, you know, an effigy hanging on a tree right near where he was born. Yeah, that's scary. Uh, that gave him the chills. Now think about that. That that's KGC within his hometown saying, you know, you know, be careful. Uh, he didn't know what he was doing back then. So, right. like I said, um, you know, they know certain people are onto the history, right, and revealing it. Um, it's one thing to, you know, come up with wild theories. It's another to be kind of doing groundwork, detective work, and putting a bigger story together without necessarily pointing fingers. We're, I don't think any of us are interested in pointing fingers. We're out to reveal how powerful this group was and what it did, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Go ahead. I would say there's a, a site that I'd never been to after this penny incident and a few others. I mean, they'd, they'd done some different things like a, a hand print where I'd been studying and I'm like, oh my goodness, what are they? I mean, it kind of looked like stop. And I thought, well, maybe that's just somebody playing around. But then I noticed they'd left a, a rubber glove they'd planted out and and uh, done that. But, but later on, I noticed that there was a very, very old hand print there and it looked like they had updated the site is what it, it appeared to me that they had been doing. And I'm like, maybe I'm following them around <laughs> too. But we we went to a, a spot, my brother and I were, um, oh golly, I don't even know how many miles from civilization we were, or hours, I mean, we were way out there and we were going to a area we thought would be a cache site. And we 
um, looked over and I'm like, hey, there's a cache site over there or a mine site. And we pulled over and there was um, a big bullseye drawn on the rock with spray paint. And I thought, that's weird. I mean, who's shooting rocks? I mean, that's right. weird. But it was the circumpunct symbol. Um, and then we looked up and we could see the, the M or the treasure room L13 um, symbol. And so we climbed up and there was a cave that had been filled in. But inside the cave, there was a little stone face with um, a bunch of wood that was arranged like a closed tunnel symbol and I'm like why it's not a place we'd ever been I, anyway we see weird things like that I, I haven't been able to make sense of it unless they're teaching somebody else or or what because that wasn't very permanent the site itself was right. but um, the little things going this is just weird I'm like are they going to reopen these sites soon and they're showing somebody or, or what but right. um, a lot of uh, weird yeah. mysteries sorry that yeah. was a weird tangent no no that's great stuff <laughs> great they're teasing you. They're yeah. So I've never been yeah. there before. I mean, yeah. this was nowhere. I mean, it was nowhere, and it's yeah. not a place I'd ever been. So it was confusing. But I, I see that a lot, and there, it looks like a lot of them are remarking some of the locations. But I don't understand why, because some of the markers are very, very permanent. Um, but to me, it looks like they maybe they're teaching somebody. I don't know. I'm not sure. Wow. But. That anyway. the next generation, possibly. Yeah, yeah that might be. Well, but there's something going on. They need, to, they need to keep it organized and coherent and traceable because I would say there's multiple billions of dollars of gold dollars involved here. Whatever's there has got to be big because the markers that they've done, I mean, the amount of work that they put into these sites, it's not yeah. just for a jar of coins. It's got to be something much bigger. No, no. There was, whoops. Go ahead. No, please. I said there was one spot we found this um, area would never have been kind of near that um, place that they arranged the stuff inside the cave. Mm -hmm. But there was a big cliff and you look off the cliff and there were some trees arranged in a big pumpkin face is what it looked like it was you could see it from google earth it was so big but it looked like wow. it was for helicopters to come down into that area but i looked over and i could see the three things that looked very much like the um the tower or the what is it the the masonic columns just very interesting stuff i'm like you can see it from google earth i mean it was we call those <laughs> pumpkin faces we call those pumpkin yeah. faces jack as in jack -Lan. there are many yeah, there are many jacks around these treasure sites. Yes, wow. there are. And the meaning of jack is kind of the in-between. I mean, it's like there's an entrance there in between worlds and all that. But anyway, but yeah, it's just interesting seeing the scale of some of the stuff going, this is really weird. I mean, something's going on. And Not when you become aware of it, yeah, yeah exactly. Too, too many of these things, especially when you see um, multiple things saying the same thing um i would never yeah. go on just one symbol or one marker because a lot of that could just be random but when you see mm -hmm. a whole bunch of it saying the exact same thing in different generations uh, or time frames and um different ways of saying this exact same thing yeah it's uh, it's it's like the intelligence services they talk about pattern yeah. recognition and whatnot so i've been to sites with the same carvings and symbols not all the same you know the ones out in utah are huge but i've seen them in arizona like that i've been to arizona utah new mexico texas oklahoma arkansas and several other states all with the same pattern wow but you know different variations right yeah i was thinking of yeah wyoming arizona nevada um yep oh golly washington state um, they have a lot of trees. It's hard to see a lot there, but I, I saw two two locations there that um, if I had the time would be worth investigating. But same symbols: the turtle and the, um, I say that the just the different markers. Yeah, they were big there in Oregon and Washington State. If you Google KGC Washington Oregon, you'll see that they were very big during that time. Yeah, really, wow. I was disappointed. I didn't see much in Florida when I was down there. I mean, I only went along the shoreline, but oh, I didn't. Wow, there are no mountains in Florida. I know, but how are they going to do <laughs> their stuff there? But I had that one cache site. I think I told you about it. We, my brother and I were following some of the old markers, and there was a great big, huge skull. I mean, it was a big skull marker, and it had the um, 
oh golly, the honeycomb in the eye and you know, all the Masonic stuff. And it looked like I had a bullet. It looked like they did it on purpose, like it looked like it had entered and exited the head, which I'm like, oh, that doesn't look very good. It looks like a warning. But right below that, I found the top of a safe that had been cut off. Um, they did, um, yeah, cut it off. And then I found the bottom, the base of the safe below it. And it had a lot of stuff that looked like it was from Florida. And I'm like, yeah. why is this here in Utah? Oh. But it was at a cache site or a vault site. I, I like to call them vault sites because I think, anyway, it looked like this one was probably very, very, very old. But I'm like, what was in this safe? They looked like they started a fire in it and burnt some of the evidence. But um, but it was had stuff from Florida. I'm going, this is really... Mm. really disturbing when you see things like that going, I don't like these kind of things. <laughs> like I wanted to find something and it wasn't very old. It was a, a fireproof safe is what it was. Um, not very, I mean, maybe 50 years at the most. I mean, probably right. 10 years old, maybe, but, but I was, anyway, I'm going on. <laughs> no, rambling. no, that's, 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 that's <laughs> right. the idea that they've been all over um, really resonates because, um, and the and the symbols also, you know, something that Warren you had mentioned on the symbols is that, and 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 you did too, Holly. Uh, the fact that there's going to be more than one, because mm -hmm. as they go over the years of well, marking on a tree or something, it might the tree might fall down or die or whatever, and then but you have multiple symbols to to tie in, you know, to really lock in what's happening there because of the fact that they may go away over time, but also. Something I thought I read in in uh, toward the back, uh, one of the last chapters of your book, Warren, was that different levels going down would have different symbols. And if you're digging down, you find this. You dig a little further down, you find this. Explain yeah. that. How, why would yeah. that? Is that like its own little treasure map? Well, it was interesting. <laughs> and the folks at Curse of Oak Island will like this too because they found stuff like this. They found similar markings, you know, they found a big G there. They found boreholes uh, of this nature, porcelain. So what they would do is they would take stove parts and other ferrous iron material, mm -hmm. and they would bury it in a key uh, cache area so that you would detect, not with a metal detector, but with what's called a dip needle compass, that you ha it would look like a watch and its needle would go this way rather than like this. Okay, yeah. And it would move when you were over an iron target. Aha, dig here. And then you'd find this plow point or a stove part and dig down. They'd also use dowsing rods, which work in a certain way they do. They detect, they can detect magnetic, you know, material like iron, um, which is induced magnetism. You know, iron is not naturally magnetic. Okay. So then they would dig down. Um, and uh, the real system is fascinating. It works like this. It's very simple. You, you see a marking. This is Bob Brewer and I, or Bob telling me, but both of us. And there'd be a carving on a tree of an owl or um, a horse, very unusual, on a beech tree. Maybe Albert Pike's name was there. And that tree was the symbol. Check with your detector. Well, you find a pistol under the tree hmm. this deep, you know, two feet, three feet down with your detector. And there was a stove part above it. And then that pistol is pointing. You follow the rifle. You follow that line and you have another intersecting line. And boom, there's your gold cache. And that's how it would work. It's just ingenious, but it's that level is micro. That's micro. Think of it as macro. The macro is the stuff we're talking about on Utah. Now, yeah, those are for smaller caches that you're, I think, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, they but were less the, permanent. That's so, why this is such a broad based book. It's micro, micro, macro, macro, macro. And Holly is macro. Um, it's almost so, like a grid. It's almost like they made a grid. They made a grid. So you have to, there are two key characters here who, whom we've mentioned. We haven't talked about John Wilkes Booth, the assassin, and Lincoln which is a big part of the movie, National Treasure 2, right. where I was a consultant. Um, two things about Jesse James, the long-lived Jesse James, and John Wilkes Booth also was long-lived. They faked his death as well. Fascinating. That We can spend 20 minutes on that later. But John, uh, Jesse James and Albert Pike, both of them, traveled across the country for a reason. The grid grid that she's seeing in Utah, Pike designed it and to his dying day when he was well into his 70s. He went all across the country 
I couldn't believe, and he had done that as a young man too. And his his brother or his cousin was Zubal on Pike, as in Pike's Peak, out in Colorado. So he was he was an adventurer. He was a rugged guy, and he he went to all these depositories that he designed to check on them. And then Jesse James was the the treasurer, the field commander. He organized it all, made sure it was intact. Jesse passed on the information to his trusted grandson. Jesse James III, Orvis Lehoff. So Jesse James, under the name J. Frank Dalton, um, lived until, I believe, 1952 or so, a crazy number. When he, he lived until he was 104, 107, I can't remember the exact dates, but it's, it's irrelevant. But he actually came out and walked in Oklahoma in 1948 and said, I am Jesse James. And you know how I know this? I, I, I mean, there's so many reasons that it's factual. His number one bodyguard and deputy was a very tall black fellow uh, who lived till he was 118 years old. And they wrote stories about him. And he acknowledged that he was the defender of Jesse James. Um, Jesse James was a very unique person. He, he was uh, very, very smart, he was loved and feared at the same time. And he had great contacts in the Native American population, the black population, and the white population at the time. Uh, he was a 33rd degree Mason. Mm -hmm. The Masons won't acknowledge that, but I think it's a fact. Yeah. Uh, and was Pike a 33rd Mason also, if I remember correctly? Who? Pike. Pike. Oh, he was, yeah. the, he, was ultimate. He, he was the ultimate 33rd degree Mason. Yeah. Wow. He wrote, he wrote a lot of the, the rights. A lot of the uh, he wrote morals and dogma, yeah, Got that on my kind show. of uh, kind of philosophical doctrine. So it's it's the Knights of the Golden Circle. Um, I would like to see it taught as a course. I hope I'm able oh, to I teach the you. first one at the big universities because um, it's the hidden history of America. Everybody, uh, don't just see the Civil War. For what it was. Let, yeah. me, let me let me address that just a little bit, please, because um, that's something that that you know, as we talked about earlier, um, you know, we were taught in school about the Civil War, but it wasn't until I started researching this uh, again, to get preparing for this interview and and reading your book, I had no idea. So please elaborate on that a little bit for us. Right. Well, it's hard for me to say specifically what was going on, but let's look at it this way. Uh, the free Masonic movement was very powerful in Europe. It, it led to the French Revolution and, and to some other great upheavals. The Masons had incredible influence there. Were, were those Masonic revolutions? Maybe, but they were definitely involved. So what people don't understand about our civil war is that the British and the French, this goes back to Oak Island a little bit, their Masonic bases in those countries were powerful and the british and the french were actually on the side of the confederacy nobody talks about this but they were they were supporting the confederacy they couldn't get through because it was all blockaded right but they, did, they did support the confederacy from canada the british were there and the french were there when gettysburg was lost they backed off they went more neutral but they were definitely allies of the confederacy mm -hmm. uh, john wilkes booth got all his money from banks in Montreal before the assassination or kidnap attempts. So um, I would argue, I do argue in this book, that the KGC as a Confederate Masonic organization fomented the Civil War. They pushed it on the country. They fomented abolitionism and pro-slavery movements at the same time. The question is, why would they do that? Well. The cynics would say to keep America divided. It was a natural resource, resource rich country that could challenge the power base in Europe. When Lincoln um, said he would finance the war, not by taking loans from Europe, from their power base, but by being independent and issuing greenbacks, backed by the, backed by the faith of the US government, that was a big challenge. So, if you read these 
mysterious documents from back in the 1800s, they suggest that there was a cabal, let's call it a conspiracy. Now, I do not like, and I will never want to be called a conspiracy theorist because I am not, I am a journalist and a historian and researcher. So the point I'm gonna make is this, the Knights of the Golden Circle were a conspiracy. Absolutely, the US government called it the, the great conspiracy. They put their, their US, the Attorney General basically, of the United States onto the KGC as the war was starting to take off. As Jack said, investigate how powerful they are in the North, in Ohio, Val Landigam and others. You'll read about these characters in, in Illinois, in Indiana, um, and it was a conspiracy to the point that I think few people know this fact, that every single member of the John Wilkes Booth assassination camp, whatever you want to call it, let's call it the, um, uh, of the entourage of Booth, every single one, and you know who they were, Surratt, Mary Surratt, you know, Atzerod, all those, every single one. What do you think they were asked once they had the handcuffs on them? What, what question was asked in them? What one question? Hmm. Are you a member of KGC? The KGC, every single time. Actually, they were, Lincoln was warned every, every week, eventually, we have letters that the KGC was going to try to assassinate him. So, Let's think about this. They fomented the war. They try to get Lincoln elected to help foment the war, dubbing him as a tyrant to get people excited about their rights, et cetera, slavery, right. states' rights. Slavery. Then they try to kidnap him. They try to, they do assassinate him. And then they go on to be very powerful after the war, maybe to have a second civil war because they didn't do so well the first time. Um, and then when that motivation goes away, why does it keep on going? Who has the upper hand in the KGC? Yeah. It's, oh. it's a college course for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. But I know that, you know, talking about in going back to your book, you know, you talked about some of the people that, you know, um, and I'm at a loss for a name. Uh, Jack mentioned it earlier before we got on the show here, the vice president. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Breckenridge. Breckenridge. Yes. Now he was a member supposedly of the KGC, correct? Oh, absolutely. From Kentucky. Uh, absolutely. And he, he was on the gold train when it ended. Yeah. With Judah <laughs> Benjamin. And they fled. To, where did they go? They went to London. Benjamin. They went to London. And they went to Canada. My God. Canada. Jack and Jeff and Holly knows this. When this all comes to light, history will be not necessarily rewritten, but reconsidered. This is this right. is incredible stuff. Think about the infiltration of the union that these guys had. General McClellan. That's why he didn't push harder. They say, you know, and, and he actually ran against Lincoln. I think uh, at some point. Um, he ran, I ran against Lincoln for real when Lincoln was reelected. Yes, he did. He did. And um, okay, so let's take this back to Oak Island, right? So. If the Templars and came to Oak Island and to uh, New Ross, that area, those two areas, right? Uh, they established a, a, a foothold there that was Masonic, right? And maybe they brought treasure in material terms and in terms of documents, sacred documents there. Um, well, if you look at some of the secret thinking of the KGC and Pike and others, it goes back to uh, some people we all know about, like Francis Bacon and his cipher and his science and his tunneling. Um, it's a tradition that's beautiful because we're talking about tunneling here, right? And and booby traps and flooding. It's all mm -hmm. the same. Yep. I mean, crap, if you go looking for this treasure and you don't know what you're doing <laughs> and you see a red hand, be careful. You get, could get yourself blown up. Gunpowder stays active. And watch out for flood tunnels. And, and don't think Especially you're if they're updating them. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. If they are updating them yeah. for sure. Yeah. I think they are. Yeah. Like if they're updating uh -huh. them, you're. <laughs> and and uh, there. 
Yeah, now they have technology that is very sensitive to protect these sites. Oak Island is interesting because it's, I mean, the Laginas now have full access. You have to do things by the book and, you know, work with the government there and the archaeologists. But they can dig where they want to. Um, it's expensive, great technology. You have to bring to bear great technology. And something about myself that I didn't talk about is um, I mentioned Alan Witten, didn't I, at, at the beginning, uh, the, the professor. Well, geophysics. So I have a background in geophysics. So you have to know which equipment <coughs> that to bring in that can remotely characterize the underground to uh, to see the subsurface without digging. And you need to be able to do that if you're going to get a permit to dig things. You know, you need to say that there's something really there. Metal detectors are okay, but they're not the equivalent of um, EM31s and other pieces like that that the military uses. All right. I jumped around on that. Sorry about no, that. No, no, that's okay. And, and you know, and looking at that from, from the Oak Island uh, point of view is that, um, you know, there there's some of the, the – the, well, there's always been the talk about the fact that the um, – that maybe the treasure that was or could be on Oak Island, part of that or all of it was used to help fund the uh, Revolutionary War. Um, so you had, you know, that that kind of goes back in a whole nother area there. But, you know, looking at the way that that could have been the different levels and the different symbolisms that are going on there, um, I can see the tie back to, you know, the way that the KGC did things in, in that respect, but now did it really, did it really because it was passed on? You know, we talk about the Freemasons and some people say, okay, the Templars were there. Then the Templars became the Freemasons mm -hmm. and the Masons. And then they took out now, whether or not that's true, I don't know. I really have no idea, but the ideas from those have been passed down through all these different, um, generations and they like you said like we had talked about earlier they kind of grab some of those traditions yeah so you have franklin roosevelt who as a young man yep. maybe in connection right. to the plymouth family went to oak island but he also was a 33rd degree scottish right freemason mm -hmm. and he also was involved i think in moving some of these treasures during the 30s and his policy on gold was very interesting at the time, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, the, the Sinclair family up in um, in you know, Nova Scotia, extremely important. Um, D, John D. and his role, and Francis Bacon. Um, there's no question that uh, Albert Pike and the high-ranking Scottish Rite Masons. Uh, incorporated their thinking, their code, into the KGC program. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's what I was. I was, was kind of going around about there, but that's actually what I was trying to get to with that, um, because it, it, you know, they they definitely borrowed on that. So you know that there was, you know, it it all ties together in that respect. You know, everything, everything, all the stuff, kind of, you know, everybody's saying, okay, well, Oak Island has nothing to do with the KGC, but yes, they are kind of related in that way. And that's that's the that's the okay. beauty of it now that that we can see that and like you said earlier and and Warren I was I'm so glad you brought that up not not necessarily is it going to change American history but we're going to get so much more information about American history and all this and the same thing that they're doing on Oak Island some of the things that they've already discovered and things that they're looking into could very well modify what we have been taught over the years about that. And I think that, like you said, with the, with the, uh, the civil war, again, going back to that earlier that we talked about earlier, it has changed exactly what my belief was on that. I, it's goes so much more, so much deeper than I could have ever imagined. It is. It's the secret history of America. It, and, it, and it's fascinating because now I want I want to know. I really want to dig into this now. When I was a kid, you know, you're taught, you know, civ, you know, the Civil War or whatever. You're like, eh, OK, yeah, they were, you know, they, these guys wanted slavery. These guys didn't. You know, big deal. So it's over. But so, no, there's so much. It goes so much deeper than that. So on those lines, Jeff. Um, whew, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not linear. Uh, the revolution with Benjamin Franklin being a very powerful Mason, George mm -hmm. Washington, mm -hmm. 
you could say that the American Revolution was maybe a Masonic-led revolution, meaning against the established power of Britain. Mm -hmm. But then again, the Masons were embedded in the power structure of Britain. So, right. but the Civil War comes after America is emerging as a true industrial power, right? right. That's the key thing, as it's starting to emerge, you know, the cotton trade, and industrial and things like that, yes. The cotton mill, the cotton trade, mechanization, rails starting to emerge. And maybe there was fear that this upstart nation would really become the power base of the world, and they didn't want it to get too strong. Maybe. It's un unclear. But where where this all fits in and how where does Albert Pike pivot the whole thing? Um, as a pivot from Lincoln and, and Franklin is mysterious. Yep, for sure. Go ahead, Holly. Oh, I was gonna say Thomas Jefferson looked like he was involved in some of these areas too. He's standing in front of a, a, a picture that um, looks like one of these vault sites. And anyway, it looked like he was involved as well, clear back yeah. then, but anyway, well, quite fascinating. He was a oh, just out of curiosity, are there any Masonic lodges in Utah or anything that you know of? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep, there are. And the Territorial State House has, um, anyway, the Masonic. Um, it looks like they, they came in. Oh, what do they do? They What's that word I'm looking for? <laughs> anyway, Design. yeah. Anyway, they've got it, the, the cornerstone. They came uh, in. Dedicated. Ded dedicated. Dedicated. Yeah, they came and dedicated that. But um, Fort Crittenden um, oh, it used to be Camp Floyd. Um, that uh, had a lot of the Masonic lodges there clear back um, at the beginning of Utah's history. Um, and that, anyway, the word Crittenden is um, anyway tied to the KGC and in this Jesse James book as well. But there's, um, yeah, there's information for cash site at Fort Crittenden as well. Yep, and Kit Carson with Fort Carson, and Kit Carson in Colorado, and he was a high-ranking Mason, um, friend of Jesse. And but the, when we say Masonry here, we're really talking about what I call advanced Masonry. You know, the thirty-second and higher degrees of the Scott outer Scott sanctum and York Rite Masonry as well, but not the first three degrees, which most Masons adhere to or, or belong to. Craft Masonry. It's the stuff we're talking about. The KGC. And its planning and organization was at a much higher level than than your normal lodges that you see. But the organization of the KGC into castles, okay, masonry has their lodges, but the KGC had castles. Mm -hmm. Then John Wilkes Booth was a member of the KGC castle in Baltimore. Um, and uh, so, you know, today there are about 2 million or so, maybe less, Freemasons in America. I mean, there, there used to be quite a bit more it's decline, but um, I think interest is picking up again. Some, something that, uh, um, Holly, something that you and I had mentioned uh, when we were talking on the phone, or you had mentioned when we were talking on the phone, was uh, the the oak, talking about oak. The order, oh. and was that the Order of American Knights? Is that yep, what that the, is? Uh -huh, the Order of the American Knights, um, the KGC. Sort of yeah, they ended up... Um, turning into the order of the american knight and then um the sons of liberty or was which way was it sons of liberty was the last one was it That's right. okay i can't remember the dates on them they kind of were in a quick quick order there but by name, um, yeah. by name only though i mean it's <laughs> yeah but the order of the american knights was interesting with these groups a lot of times um words i mean i've noticed early on words mean things mm -hmm. and a lot of times they'll put that information right out in um right out in public and unless you understand the way that they think you won't think anything of these words but they used etymology an awful lot too with um with the words that they they chose to name things um and you can anyway find s some really neat trails um of information with uh with words but i think the name oak island uh I don't know. I'm like, it sounds like it could be a spot for a cache or a vault site. I know. And in fact, every, you know, people have asked over the years, it's like, well, if there was oak, oak trees on Oak Island, and we know that there was, mm -hmm. there was a yeah. particular kind of oak tree that was there. Um, they're like, well, what about the acorns? How come the acorns didn't fall and plant and grow more oak trees? Why are there basically none there now? Um, 
But yeah, that's just weird that the uh, yeah. oh, how that that when you had mentioned that on the phone to me, I was like, oh wow, that just that just yeah. <laughs> down. Why is that? Why does that? Uh, you know. Well, the oak has a lot of meanings, but yeah, at, at some of the the newer areas where these um, KGC the guys, weed. yeah, they actually drew the oak um, at some of these sites. Some of it goes back very old. I mean, it's very symbolic of a lot of things, but that's why they used it. And yeah, the, uh, did they, they change the name also just to have an add another layer of protection? Yeah, yeah. exactly. They did. There's a lot to that. Definitely. They also, um, going back to the link to, you know, what happened in Canada. So they use Baconian cipher, right? The Bacon system of ciphers, what the KGC used as well. So the Francis Bacon link is really important and double meanings and interpreting things in many ways to get your desired location. Um, so Bacon, Bacon was a really key person there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I've got a couple of questions uh, that I would like to uh, ask too from the some of our members, and this one was, excuse me, this one was uh, for Holly. It was from Jack Myers, um, and uh, he has one for each of you. He said for Holly, he says, "What is your opinion on the Victoria Peak, uh, New Mexico treasure story? Supposedly, a man named Doc Noss discovered in 1937 a tremendous treasure of gold bars and Wells Fargo boxes." Uh, Ill, uh, filled with coins buried in a cavern below a desolate peak. Could that be part of the legendary Confederate gold? What, do you know anything? I would about? say it was tied to tied to the way that the these groups work. Yes, I say I'm not sure exactly which which group, but um, to me it sounds yeah. And like it's a lot of times you'll find these caches will have different eras of stuff in them. Um, some people will say, hey, that. That thing that you guys are anyway. There was a cave that somebody found here in Utah years and years ago, and they uh, they had different eras of stuff found there. And like, oh, the guy faked it because this thing was not real because it's new or newer than this other stuff. And um, anyway, a lot of times they'll have the Spanish stuff in these vaults along with anyway all kinds of eras. But to me, it sounds like it could be tied to. The Knights of Gold well, Circle. I imagine Warren's got other yeah, thoughts I'll, on I'll, that. I'll go way beyond that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Okay. I think Warren will be able to. Well, that better. the Victoria Peak story is phenomenally interesting and it's true. And that was the biggest KGC discovery ever. And the government got its hands on it. The U.S. Army seized it. And I'm not going to go into those details, but um, that money was taken as gold bars, not coins. There were some jewels, but it was mostly gold bars from Mexico by the Knights of the Golden Circle. Uh, two of their generals went over at the end of the war to rescue Maximilian, who was a French puppet, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, they brought his treasure over the border and put it in a limestone cavern uh, that was discovered accidentally by Doc Noss. He was hunting and he he saw a cavern uh, and he, he, he roped himself down into it, into this huge mountaintop and um, found these bars and tried to secret some of these things. And he did, and he got into a gunfight with somebody who killed him, but he had buried some of the bars. I know somebody who knows where they are. Um, they recovered some of them. At least they had that one guy. Some, were, some were recovered and his partner admitted to it on, on tape. And, um, <laughs> And then our, our air, when it became White Sands Missile Base, um, a couple of Air Force guys found them and reported them up to the U.S. Treasury. And all kinds of crazy crap happened after that, which I'm not going to go into. A lot of I'm death. Gonna tell, I'm going to tell you that it was mentioned by John Dean in the Watergate hearings. Oh, so really? He didn't know about it. And I interviewed F. Lee Bailey, who just died, about it. Wow. And I know a bucket load about it and I just don't talk about it. Yeah, I don't let's, talk about it. <laughs> let me say this. It, it was the biggest recovery of KGC money. So it was gold from Mexico. It could have been Spanish gold, right? But it was under the, the power of Emperor Maximilian and his wife, Charlotte. I've seen pictures of her crown. Her crown. Right yeah, it was pretty. But, but no bars were ever photographed that I'm aware of. So why didn't it appear in my book? Well, for some reasons that I've alluded to, but also I didn't have absolute proof of the bars, but I can tell you factually, I know what happened. 
because they sent uh, Shelby over the border uh, to rescue Max Maximilian and Jesse James organized it. And don't forget that was the first official uh, mission of the front man of the KGC to go over Bickley, to go over and invade Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. That never happened. They got kind of thwarted or never really materialized to the point of an invasion in Texas. But that was what happened. And it's a fact that it did happen. Uh, where the money went, I think I know, but I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, another question that he had, and this one was for you, Warren. Um, and again, this is from Jack Myers. He asked, Warren, do you have an opinion on the Baltimore gold hoard discovered in 1934 by two teenagers? I don't. It's a good story. That's all I'll say. Thanks. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. It's uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I didn't even. Uh... Okay. Yeah. He alludes to that going on a little bit further here, but um, um that's really, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty nice. We also have uh, Court Lindahl. I, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Court Lindahl. Uh, he's a member of our group. He's been on the uh, on Oak Island uh, um, uh, information quite a bit, uh, some of his series. Now, he did a lot of stuff with Oak Island, but he's also doing a lot with now with Confederate, uh, Confederate gold and stuff. And I've seen some things popping up on the chat here. Um, unfortunately, my chat is not really working that well uh, for Facebook. So I'm, I, a lot of it's going by on StreamYard here, and I'm, I'm not catching names. Um, but one of the things that he said here was, um, and he's a, a fantastic researcher as well, uh, he said that the last man who uh, to note the presence of Confederate gold on the train in Danville, Virginia, was a later Grandmaster of all uh, of all. Mm -hmm. Grand Master of All American Knights Templar. Mm -hmm. um, he also became an ambassador to Hong Kong, which at that time was the British colony. Um, and he goes on to so there's some interesting stuff that he's put up here in the chat. And uh, Court Court's a friend of our group, um, and he's got some fantastic information that apparently mm -hmm. uh, you guys might want to get in touch with Court on some of this. It might help to uh, go with what you. Uh, um, yeah, I just saw another one. Court is it's on our page. Okay, um, popping up there. Yeah, a lot of a lot of folks will will talk about that Confederate treasure train and where did it go and how much was involved. And that's a really fascinating story. I love people tracking that down. And Bob Brewer has been in, been involved in that. But what we're talking about really doesn't have much to do with that. This has to do with stuff that was being taken off of pay, pay wagons and trains by Jesse James at first, and then much, much bigger sums of money than anything that would have amounted to from mining and all these operations we've been talking about. So it's impossible for um, that little hoard that was being taken from rich men through Danville down to Macon, Georgia, for that to have added up to that much. It really wasn't all that much money. Right. And you were talking on the show, you had talked about billions. I mean, you were oh, talking. I, I absolutely stick to billions. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I was looking into in Pennsylvania with the copperheads there, that that could have been right now in today's value, 600 million alone, just that. Um, there are ones out west that are, are massive. These, these things I've talked to you about uh, in terms of the documents I've seen or the conversations, there are each 700, 500, 600 million back in the back in the 70s gold is now 2000 and out and we're talking about um we're talking about lots of tonnage tonnage of gold big big vaults um, go ahead. yeah this book has some of the names of some of the cash sites and some of the the amounts and this one um, the vanishing wagon train treasure 66 tons of gold and this is just one of um, pages and pages 66 um, tons yeah, 66 tons. Um, anyway, but there's all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, so to that point. To that point um, wow. Trust yeah. me. You know, and that's uh, just one of these. I mean, he's got, and he doesn't have all the, the cash names or the vault sites in here, but it's got enough to go. Yeah. And the names of these sites are really, really interesting. A face looking up, a face looking down. I mean, that's so tied to these rock markers that I've been mm -hmm. following. Oh, trust me, with Bob Brewer, we went to some of these sites that are named in there. And that's yeah. interesting. And so 
The authors of that book are Del Schrader, a journalist with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, who is really plugged in, and Jesse James III, Orvis Lee Hawk, the guy I've been talking about. In, 19, in the 1970s, there were a reunion of Confederate vets talking about some of this stuff. And the headline in a paper that was pretty prominent in L.A., the Herald Examiner, said hundreds of hundreds of billions, a hundred billion in, uh, in, conf in Confederate run gold buried in the U.S. That was the headline oh, over a hundred billion. And you know what? I agree with that. I believe I believe it. Seeing the the amount of effort that they put into some of these yeah. sites, I mean, yeah. just the, just the effort. Yeah. it's got to be huge. I say it's got to be huge. I think Jeff, of anything that's been said, the wisest thing that was just said came out of Holly's mouth. The effort that went into these depositories, these vaults, this coding, and the engineering. These were engineers, like core engineer yeah. people, mm -hmm. and the secrecy that was involved especially out West where it couldn't be seen mm -hmm. is just phenomenal. It's the effort that went into it. Why would they put so much effort if there's not a hundred billion dollars of gold involved? Exactly. What I find interesting is I can't remember if it was in your book and the Jesse James book or it was both. Um, it mentioned uh, that a lot of times they did um, these fault sites pretending that they were mining too. Uh, yeah. A lot of times I yeah. think they were really were, but I came across some mining papers um, <laughs> they had Sinclair. Anyway, they had some names on it that were really, really interesting. And some of the Masonic names, Alton Pepper. I mean, anyway, just some odd, odd things. But I wouldn't think anything of, of it, except that it's a vault site, the way that they laid the information out. Uh, otherwise, it's like, oh, yeah, these are just some, some people from New York or Washington out here uh, mining. But when you look at all the other evidence, it's really interesting. Holly, tell them about your own family here and their minds and all that. Hmm, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, go ahead. <laughs> That's kind of, okay, so I, I mentioned Forrest Finn. That kind of got us started. But almost at the exact same time, I was looking through my family history, and um, I was reading about a mining claim that my um, great-grandpa lost. And anyway, he he was devastated. And... Um, I guess it was, I think it was his, his dad's and his dad dad's. Anyway, it was something that had been in the family for a while, but he didn't get down and do his uh, assessment work in time that year. And a neighbor ended up claiming up the claims. But what caught my eye was um, there was a man by the name of Jesse Knight um, that had wanted to purchase this claim for a large sum of money for that day and age or for that time period. And I started looking who this Jesse Knight was and, it's interesting. I say it's, um, he, he knew his stuff. I thought, I need to go find grandpa's mine. And I just had this desire. I mean, I just needed to find where this was and it took some work, but we, I think we found it and then found the area, but there's so much at that location. And then I found out my dad's side, because that was on my mom's side, my dad's side, um, reading in the family history, it mentioned that he went down to California with Senator Clark. And I'm like, Okay, that's really weird too. <laughs> and I thought, I don't even know where to go with that information. And um, I thought, well, if he was involved, I'll probably find a clue someday. Anyway, on Facebook one day, um, his name pops up written on the rocks. And anyway, it was a vault site. And I'm like, oh, looks like you were involved in something, Grandpa. But neither side's ever told us anything about what they were involved in or, or any of the, the stuff. Um, it's word uh, of, it's word of secrecy still holds. Something. I don't know. I but don't know. I don't think I they were Confederates, though. I know that they weren't. So I'm like, I think that there's a tree with a lot of branches on it. And I just think that um, the roots go to money and um, wealth and... I don't know. But then at the same time, Jesse James, I'm like, I'm so confused because what was grandpa doing? <laughs> great, 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 three greats anyway, down with Jesse James in California. I mean, it's confusing, but um, some of the family history you get digging going, I had no idea, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I think it's a, a neat thing to look into because um, yeah, when you find out that your relatives were involved in some interesting things and maybe that's why we like, going out in the desert and <laughs> looking at rocks so much. I was uh, going to say you came by it natural. I mean, it, it was kind of found <laughs> you. You've got it in your blood. That, uh, yeah, you I can't help it. Kind of 
Yeah. Uh, wow. You know, it's funny because uh, Warren had mentioned something about uh, Bob Brewer, you know, early on that, you know, his wife was pregnant, I guess. Yeah. He was no, 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 no. Not, not Bob's, not Bob's wife. Oh. The wife. Of oh, that's Bob. right. Yeah. 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 You know, and how he kept wanting to go. I can see, I can see you. No matter what, you know, you're going to take your time to go out there and go and hike in and research, and you know, because it's in your blood so deeply. Yeah, um, it was, oh, it was you're funny. In the right area to do that. Yeah, I'd had no clue. I mean, I spent my whole life going with my dad, looking for fossils and prospecting and stuff, until I understood what I was seeing and how to see it. I'm like, this is amazing. Um, yeah. And now you're in. You yeah, <laughs> we, we, we actually share that. My first love is fossil hunting. I, I'm a yeah. fossil collector. And, I, and now I we, got, we got this treasure bug and, and this history bug going on. And, you know, the KGC is a big mystery, mm-hmm. even to the Masons who are curious about it and want to know more. And they're kind of, they're up there trying to, they're supportive of what's going on in Nova Scotia. They want to know what's going on with, you know, that, that, journey that endeavor um so these treasure sites most of them are are forgotten lost to history some are big and are still protected so the ones that we're looking for legally on private land to demonstrate the story um those are forgotten they're not protected i don't know well Well, he was growing up was always told to keep looking and he was never how did he say it? he was he would try to get ahead of himself and they would pull him back and say no you have not learned the code you haven't you you're jumping the gun you're reading things that aren't there go back do it again look at it again and it seems like throughout history that's what they did the whole time yeah bob is very studious about that He'd call me in the middle of the night saying, literally, I nearly threw up or I threw up. It was so exciting what came to me in his breaking of a map. And uh, I give him a lot of credit. He's a special guy. He's a Vietnam vet. Um, I've, you know, tried to stay in touch over the years. He's getting older. Uh, I think he's got a lot of respect for people who, uh, honor the complexity of this thing. It's complex. Oh, it involves, it involves mathematics, geometry, code breaking, s- signal processing, um, topography, mm-hmm. geophysics, geology, uh, a, a historical research ability, and an incredible amount of intuition. And I always run into a lot of that, all of that combined out there in Utah, in the various sites. Neat stuff here. Very I, cool. I want to share something that's in this book before I Please. forget, just because yeah. it's, anyway, I've got to tell you about this book too. I'm like, I'm yeah. so sorry I'm referring to it so much, but the first time I read this book, I thought it was a bunch of bogus. It was so stupid sounding. It was just like, it was. it didn't sound true. And then I'm like, but, but wait a minute, I'm seeing similar things. And after understanding how these guys' minds work, I'm like, oh, man, this book's quite coded, too. But the interesting thing at the very beginning, it says, because it is sometimes so unbelievable, the truth escapes becoming known by Heraclitus 500 BC. And I think that is so true. This stuff is in plain sight. And it's so unbelievable. I mean, some of the things I'm saying, like, this doesn't make sense. And then you learn some more stuff and think, okay, it makes sense. But these rock markers made no sense to me. Like, this is a bunch of, I mean, people like, that's pareidolia. That's just like looking at the stuff on the ceiling. Like, actually, you can follow it. I mean, if you know what you're seeing, I mean, there's, yeah, there is pareidolia. But they use this kind of thing for math for their cache sites. Right. So Holly, again, said a very wise thing. It's so massive. It's almost impossible to grasp. And that's how they want it, hidden in plain sight. So the, the, the trick here is in our lifetime, putting as much evidence as possible to start to pivot people towards believing that this organization existed and did all this stuff. Now, my challenge has been very simple, which is when one of these treasures comes out of the ground <laughs> and you tangibly put your hand on the smoking ingot, not the smoking gun, the smoking ingot gold bar. <laughs> then P- 
people have to ask, oh, you didn't just randomly trip over this like the couple did in California? Right. No, it's part of a underground network of Fort Knox's. What? There's yes. that much money there? Yes. They put that much effort into something? Yes. What was it? Bearing gold bars. I think you just said something really interesting. Underground system of Fort Knox's. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm like the gold is kept in, Easy. yeah, <laughs> hidden in these vault sites. Even in these other countries, when we've got, when we uh, caught Saddam Hussein, first thing we went for was uh, he had a pile of gold with him. I mean, it was kind of interesting to yeah. me to see that. I don't know, maybe it's not related, well, but it kind of looks like it to me. Um, well, that's that's true because what, what what does gold not do? It doesn't erode or go right. away like paper. Right. Does it right. tarnish yeah. like silver? No, it's perfectly intact. And yeah. it's very easy to conceal. Why put it in a bank? Put it in an underground vault that's huge that you can protect with electronics from 20 miles away. So every time... Bob Brewer would approach with his guys uh, a big site with a big window rock. Yeah, I'll tell you the story. It's in the book. It's in the book. And I interviewed these guys, and they were trembling when I interviewed them because they were recalling how scared they were. Mm. So Bob had a bunch of rocks in his hand as a cover story, and he was getting close to a, uh, a cash depository that he knew was there because the information pointed to it. And um, so when he turned on his detector, he must have triggered a signal, right? Electronic signal. And within 20 minutes, a helicopter appeared. I've seen many helicopters. By wow. the way. And it landed, he could tell, right over the butte. And he turned to his two, two co-searchers and said, okay, guys, stand close to me. I'll handle this. And a man packed with heat all over, no identification. And there was a woman in the background approached and he said, what are you guys doing? You shouldn't be here, something like that. Mm -hmm. And Bob said, well, you know, we're just rock hounding. And he showed him some agates in his hand. And the guy said very specifically to Bob to let him know that he knew what Bob was doing. He said, have you seen a window rock around here? How about that? <laughs> and then he left. And they, they almost were, you know, you know what I mean, trembling so hard that they were about to lose control of something. And uh, the guys were. And they all had their hands on their pistols. They thought there was going to be a shootout. Now, I say this to you because I've been in situations and heard about them where um, a team might go in to look at some carvings and there will be people showing up in wagons and SUVs with a rifle rack and saying, you're not supposed to be looking around this part or this cemetery for carving symbols, you know, not to dig, but, um, and they boot them out of there. Now, how would they know to show up right at that time? Right. 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 They're being watched. So the, how do you come up with a new area also to look at? Sorry, Jack. I thought how I, she came up with a new area in Colorado to look at every year. That's yeah, somebody put a piece of information out on the internet again. I'm always seeing these things like caught my eye because the name on the headstone was a little, I don't know, just a little bit if I'm not iffy, but it had some information that I'm like, oh, Griffin. Yeah, that's something that guards treasure. But the guy's name was Clifford Griffin. And anyway, they built this monument on the way up there is what it looked like on the edge of the mountain and they had this story about him being a heartbroken man that came out west and um, started mining and I guess his uh, fiance supposedly or had died um, right the night before he was supposed to get married and then so he was kind of a alone not a loner I don't know he, he was kind of withdrawn from everybody on the this mining area and he uh, he would go up there on the edge of the cliff there and play his violin um, every day after working the mines. And it said that he was very wealthy and his brother was extremely wealthy too. Um, but what was interesting is um, they said that he uh, played an especially beautiful tune and um, then they, the people, the, the miners down below heard a gunshot. And so they all ran up there and he was faced down in a grave that he'd dug in bedrock is what it sounded like. And I thought that sounds a little 
Is she? But this monument, anyway, is great big, huge, massive thing, um, and the names on it. And I noticed the his dad was I can't remember what his name was, but something is Squire, which I thought, oh, that sounds kind of tied to the Squire at our, at our site. Mm -hmm. But just just the name just seemed a little bit something yeah. to look into. But one of the treasures in here is called Tall Tall Tombstone Treasure or something along that line. But I imagine there's something in that area and there's probably a vault that they covered up, whether there's somebody that died. I mean, it really could be there. They did their gate guards or can't what, um, anyway, they usually left, killed people. It just goes to show how far in the West or how far along they went, how many places that they went. Oh around. yeah. Yeah. How many places there could be. Yeah. yeah they, they use these uh, stories like what was inscripted there on that tombstone as maps. Those are what we call waybills. They're coded. They're, they're, they, don't, they don't make any sense. They're obviously embellished, but there's a reason for the insider to get information to go there. Yeah. Well, what was interesting too, when I was reading about the name of this, um, this town or this, uh, I don't know, this town or the, the mining claim, it was called Silver Plume. And anyway, when they were trying to come up with a name for it, they, the guy said, um, you already have the name. It was written on the ore that you brought me. Um, because anyway, supposedly the, the silver ore looked like a plume. And anyway, he wrote this poem. And it, anyway, it begins with, the nights today are miners bold. And I thought, that's exactly what I've been seeing. Mm -hmm. um, the nights today are miners bold. But the, the interesting thing about the plume, I noticed um, there on Oak Island, you've got um, one of those rocks. I can't remember which one it was. It seemed like it had the loon written on it. And, but it looked I think somebody said it was a tree. It had 33 little things on it, but I, I kind of think that's a, a plume, an ostrich plume as well. That's no, tied no, no, no. to a lot of these sites. Um, you'll see that quite often. But that's, anyway, just some of the code words that they use and symbols and things that, and it's probably a tree too, but it looks like, I've, I've seen here in Utah, they've got some drawings on the rocks that have people wearing the their old Masonic hats with the ostrich plumes on them mm -hmm. as well. But anyway, that's kind of a, weird tangent <laughs> but there it's just it's everywhere not everywhere but it is where it is and if you start understanding their code and their their words and their thought processes you'll notice other places to check out and to look into right very fascinating stuff it really is yeah if you can't if you can't be a desert detective kgc uh hunter like like holly you can at least do your <laughs> research in your archives oh. and your family history and it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, Canada has Oak Island, and Jesse James actually went to Canada quite a bit to Toronto. And that a lot. That was a really? Big, that was uh -huh. a big holdout for the KPC, Montreal and Toronto, as, as mentioned. But, um, you know, for your viewers and the listeners, it's really something. This is the most powerful chapter in hidden American history, the KPC. And it started in the 1830s with John Calhoun. And it went all the way through, no longer becoming a Confederate issue, into the 20th century, and I would have to imagine till today. Yep. And that's the thing that I wanted to, and we're about ready to wrap up here. We're about an hour and 48 minutes into this already. So, um, and I like to try to limit it to two hours. But um, the, the the thing of that that it is is that we hear so much like with Oak Island, you know, they've been digging and digging and digging and they've been trying to do the research, but they haven't really found anything yet. This is a, this is a piece of history where yes, things have been found. That's true. Bob Brewer himself. If you read, if you read Warren's book, Bob Brewer himself has found some of this. And so it's not one of these fairy tales that oh yeah well it could be this it could be that no that it's it's already much of it has already been proven so you can go into it looking at that rather than thinking that oh my goodness you know this is just going to be one of those wild goose chases it's not because it's already you know men, much of it uh oh we lost holly much of it has already been proven and that's that's the important thing that i think people need to understand it's not a fairy tale it's it's actually true yeah, there's a lot of touchstones to this. If you include Victoria Peak in it, then you'll say, wow, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's a lot of treasure that's been recovered. And, and, he was considered, and he was considered crazy for many years for going after this. Mm -hmm. People were saying, why are you doing this? You have a family to feed, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, talking about Bob. 
Bob, I mean, yeah. he, was, he caught a lot of he caught a lot of heat, or his wife did, anyhow. No, he did. He, you're right, absolutely. They thought he was crazy, and he proved him wrong. And he set this whole thing in motion because the book that we did, Bob and myself, has now set a sort of uh, KGC mystery crowd in motion. Right, a lot of people. Are interested in researching it or going out in the field? I'm one. <laughs> if, if you're going I'm out in the field, out. if you're going out in the field, temper your expectations about finding things. If you find the symbols and clues, very cool. Nice. It's very hard to get to the final point. Yeah. Uh, and be careful: snakes, mm. ticks, uh, booby traps, potentially, and other things that you might read in the book to learn about. Mm -hmm. And it's a really good book. So I, I suggest that people check this out if you oh, haven't already. Um, and it's a, it's available on Amazon and all that. I That's where I got my that's copy. That's where I got my copy too. Yeah. So now uh, I'm going to read it again because now I can understand more of it since we've been able to talk to you. There, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my power <laughs> turned off for a minute there. And I'm like, oh, no. no. We, we saw you were frozen. I looked over and I thought, oh, she's frozen. And then, I got scared. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> it's the, it, they're watching us and we're talking about it too much. And they're going to, you know, <laughs> rock be. the show now. But uh, anyway, like I said, we're starting to wrap up a little bit. But I was, as I was uh, talking about there when we launched you, was the fact that, that this isn't a fairy tale. Uh, this isn't one of those those things that are aren't ever going to be you know uh, come to a conclusion on. There has been treasure already found, um, or at least you know in small portions, small caches as you call them. Um, so you know if people, um, you know I really uh, hope that people will check out your uh, website and your um, you've got your um, Facebook page, Holly, and I've forgotten the name of it. Uh, it's Go ahead, if you would, give us that name real quick. If I can remember it, Holly S. Remkes, Desert Detective, or Treasure Hunter and Desert Detective. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, it's just on Facebook. Um, How many members do you have, Holly? I think I've only got like three, or between three and 400. I'm not sure. I haven't really watched too well, much. One, but, that yeah. I joined, one that I joined yesterday, but had a lot of, where I got the Colorado thing from, I had a lot of pictures, a lot of pictures uh -huh. out of it. I cannot remember. Which yeah, one I think was. that was fun. Yep, that was yeah, probably I, it. I joined that too, and you know your website, and I know that you've been sharing a lot of pictures with our group as well. Yeah. We really do appreciate that <laughs> very much. But check out her website. Actually, if you just go to uh, Facebook and you put in her name Holly S. Um, Remkis, and you will see. Uh, you look at the spelling there of her name right there, and you will find hers. Uh, her page there as well as uh, some other good information i think you also make some jewelry or you have gemstones <laughs> that you actually uh turn into yeah. jewelry and things like that too really interesting there, is that a regular website of its own um yeah we have an etsy store for gemstones etsy. mostly okay. so yeah on etsy yep that's really cool Flowing now gems, warren, if you want to buy a gemstone <laughs> yeah, great you know uh, Warren, you also have uh, a couple of different, you, you, and we were kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. And yeah, I see that uh, looks like somebody's putting it up uh, on the uh, on the chat there for everyone to see. Um, but Warren, you also have a couple of uh, uh, different websites as well, right? You you have your uh, yeah. I, I set up. I wrote a novel this year, uh, actually last year, called Panic, and it's about kids with anxiety and depression. It's a novel, and I have some music embedded in it. It's called. It's an ebook with uh, on panic, and I have a website called panicstory.com. And ironically, we launched a national age of anxiety campus tour for the kids in high school and college, starting here in DC, and then COVID hit and shut us down. But now anxiety is even a bigger issue for kids yep, and, sure and and their parents, you know. So we're hoping to relaunch that. If you like um, kind of an interesting story, it's. Uh, Panicstory.com is the website. You can buy it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and whatnot. And the music is really good. Briefly, I, uh, I met a young, a young group down in uh, Ch Charleston uh, where my kids had gone to college. And the lead singer couldn't leave his house for two years. And, he's, and he put together a band with his brother and other guys. It's a fantastic band called Social Void. So I embedded their songs in my novel, and we're going on tour together. Oh wow, that's fantastic! Yeah. Yeah, actually, you did something that was ahead of the ahead of its time almost. It's COVID right before COVID. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's amazing, Jack. And uh, you know, we really connected with the students. They they loved coming up to the mic and talking about their own experience 
uh, and how, to, how they were coping with anxiety issues. And uh, Chip Cooley, the leader of the band, would talk to him. And then I'd talk about the book. And then we had a panel discussion with the therapists on stage. And we hope this thing can go around the country to right. colleges, universities. Okay. Well, we certainly would like to from Showing my age, I know I've been affected more than anybody <laughs> else. And you three, just because I'm at the point in my 70s where I didn't want to go off for fear of getting COVID. Right. <laughs> That's now we hope we can. Yeah. We hope we can actually perform in front of you know these these school audiences again. We'll see. Well, we certainly hope you can, and we hope that maybe this will help to get that get the word out there a little bit about that because that's fantastic work, and yeah. really commend you for for going to that uh, that extent on it. That's really good stuff. Um, Holly, did you have a new book too? Did you did you mention that earlier that a, a book that you've been um, with on? Yeah, it's the Circumpunct. I yeah, thought I'd write a little bit about the symbols because they're so fascinating and I thought I'd start with the anyway the very first one that um, came to mind and anyway it's a it's a good book and say if you're into trying to understand um, symbols I'm hoping to write some more but um, yeah this one's a symbol of gold god and the sun and it, it, it kind of gives you an understanding of the thought processes of these people who set up these cash sites I believe um, a lot of them had a lot of depth I think a lot of them were really neat people and some were not <laughs> but the symbols right. that they used were really right. cool and um i think it's it's a neat thing to study symbols because it feels like our society today we don't do enough of that um and i think that we should should keep studying um our history I and so, so we can understand that it's a it's a neat thing i say the, the treasure hunting sure can lead to all kinds of interesting mm -hmm. pathways right and those symbols are so vast and there's you know it's such a, and it would take a lifetime uh you know for somebody like me to try to start learning it now well you really have to dig into it deep and uh um you know to try to get in, anywhere near where you are now so you by you doing this book uh helps all of us uh quite honestly mm -hmm. to be able to get an education a lot quicker into this uh, rather than spending a lifetime like bob brewer and and, and you or you know uh <laughs> to understand these things so that's really really interesting and i'm glad that uh you have done this now you're gonna apparently you're gonna be doing some more it sounds like yeah it's hard to write something <laughs> when you feel like you're not an expert yet because you've like oh i know the meaning and then you're like oh i don't or i do and, and it's it just it's just a process so hopefully this will mm -hmm. help people on their own journey and and they i mean there might be people with more um more insight on some of the things that i share but some of the things i think that um it should be very helpful and I wish I would have had a book like this. I know. <laughs> See, that's, that's I have a lot of books. Exactly <laughs> I had right. Warren's book and things like that. But Hey, I just want to say thank you so much, Jeff and Jack. I had a great time. I hope your, uh, your folks on the show enjoyed it. I love working with the Laginas and uh, Maddie and uh, love the show, Beyond and Curse. And let's hope it continues. You know, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, this has really been great. And we really appreciate both we of you. We thank you for being here. Yeah. Oh, thank you really so good. much. Yeah, yeah. appreciate and this it, opportunity so much. You guys are amazing. Well, thank we do. We, we appreciate it so much. Thank and you, Warren. So having that, uh, you, you, I see it looks like that, uh, Linda put your book up on there. Um, and will is that available on uh, uh, Amazon and all that as well? I think so. The other okay. day I looked and it was totally gone. And oh, wow, anyway, okay. about for a whole day and then it was back again. So I don't okay. know. It should well, we'll be there. Sure Link down here for everybody it's, to see. Yeah. I'm and hoping it, to update it a little bit too. I say it's got a few typos. I did it really quick on a program that was giving me a lot of problems. So the if there, if you find a typo, it's not code. At least not yet. I'm thinking I might do that in another book. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, that's great, right there. So, I'm I think it later on I might use that because that'd be kind of fun. I'll tell you where one of these caches are. You can. Oh. Yeah, if you get a chance to go out to Utah and spend some time out in the field with Holly, you'll remember. It. I would love to. Yeah. I would love to. And I was gonna. I, well, I always hate inviting myself into things like that. You're but, invited. You know, all right. Yes. Yes. Wear some snake yes. shaps. I was dying okay. when Warren was. Uh, anyway, when we were uh, doing the Felshaw site, and I looked over, and he had his feet down between the rocks, and I thought, well, I'm not gonna tell him that he shouldn't be doing that because there's probably rattlesnakes down there. But he was fine. <laughs>
Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank God. So you guys don't have one of those crews that go in first to make sure there's no, no, no. critters around before you walk into an area. Yeah, yeah that's, that's incredible. <laughs> Oh man, they're that's usually nuts. really, yeah, no big oh, deal. I'll tell you what, I'm definitely going to be heading to Utah. There's no doubt about it. Well, thank you guys so much again. And all the viewers that have been watching, we really appreciate that you guys were here today watching this. And uh, this, what a couple of hours worth of fascinating information mm -hmm. that we just got. And, and we're going to hopefully have you guys back on at some point. We'd really like to. I hope that. Because obviously you're not giving up on your research. This is going to be an ongoing thing for both of you, obviously. Yeah. And we'd like to know down the road when you have some stuff that, hey, there's the dog. Yeah. What was his name again? Yeah, he's yeah. been working yeah. on some yeah. cool stuff. Yeah, okay, Dad, you've been on for two hours. we got to go out. <laughs> to go. Yeah, like you're done. To go. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, folks, for uh, joining thank us you. here today. And uh, we will have more information coming to you as soon as possible. All right. Guys, appreciate enjoy you guys. your day. And if you're out there on the YouTube side, please click on that subscribe button for us. We appreciate it very much. All right, everyone, have a great day. Thank you very much. You bye -bye. too. Thanks. Bye bye, guys. Yeah.